Greetings, and welcome to the Thirsty Mage, the podcast that refuses to acknowledge that the Nintendo Switch has a touchscreen. I'm your host for this episode, someone under no circumstances will be touching my screen with my finger or a stylus, David Lloyd. And uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is because we're talking about games that were designed for the DS and the 3DS that are now being ported to the Switch. Joining me fresh from playing the Etrian Odyssey trilogy on Switch and here to drop some of his opinions on uh, said game, it's Jordan Rudick. Yeah, very fresh, as in like when we're recording this on Wednesday, our, our reviews are literally dropping in five minutes, at least for the first game they're <laughs> dropping. So uh, and then we'll have uh, two and three. Uh, the next day. So uh, when you're listening to this, uh, everybody, you will be able to check out our, our full reviews on NWR for uh, Etrian Odyssey uh, 1, 2, and 3, uh, which are part of the Etrian Odyssey Origins collection. Uh, those are the first three games in the series uh, that have all been kind of remastered in HD and then uh, sold together, or you can buy them separately as well. Um, yeah, but uh, it, it, you know, it's been nice kind of going back to the... I really like these games. I love the series. I've played almost all of the games. Uh, not necessarily finish them all because th- these are really long dungeon crawling RPGs that have uh, generally a very high uh, difficulty curve uh, and, and require a lot of grinding, a lot of strategizing. Uh, but I do thoroughly enjoy them, uh, and I, I do. Uh, I am excited to uh, talk about the the trilogy that's been brought over to Switch now, uh, and uh, especially the the third one, which is the one that I, I ended up taking on for review. Yeah, I know uh, it's we've been. There's been some discussion about it in the Discord uh, about this particular series uh, coming to Switch, and it, it's also coming to Steam, and I'm assuming PlayStation as well. And uh, but the first thing that that comes to mind for me <laughs> is the incredible price. <laughs> it's like I don't know. It's almost I know Breath of the Wild, um, what or not Breath of the Wild, Tears of the Kingdom is not like the first, the first game that kind of broke that. Well, in in Canada it's seventy nine ninety nine. Uh, in the U.S. I believe it's fifty nine ninety nine barrier. Uh, but it just seems like it, the, the bubble has been burst because yeah. we had like the Pixel Remaster. I don't don't exactly remember how much that that was for Switch. I remember paying over a hundred bucks for it on Steam. Uh, and now I'm looking at uh, the price like in Canadian and with with a thirty three percent pre-purchase discount it's still 107 dollars canadian yeah like, it's wild and and it's they're 53 dollars uh f- like each so you get one two and three all hd remakes but yeah they're 53 american each if, if you buy them separately so that's it's, for the uh, etrian odyssey games david yeah yeah so the, the wow. at least the collection in canadian is 105 so what so what it yeah. looks it's almost like you're buying two getting one free at that point i guess yeah, I guess it's the way to look at it. <laughs> I mean, that that's such 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 a steep discount for buying all three. You might as well, you know, if you again, if you like these games and you want to replay them and you you feel like you you, you could go for all three, I would just say buy the collection um, and then and just be done with it. But it it is a little bit steep, I think. Being honest, I think thinking about they, these really are remasters rather than remakes. There, it's more of a fresh coat of paint and. Uh, obviously some finagling done to get them to play with button controls. And we're going to get into that later. Um, but yeah, th- th- there isn't a lot of, I don't want to say extra effort, but I, uh, you know, I, these are, if you've played them before the, the original versions on DS, like they, they look and feel very similar to that. You know, there aren't major mechanical or um, gameplay changes added in these versions. There, there are some, some minor updates and increase um, uh, adjustments maybe, but yeah, it, it's kind of what you see is what you get, I suppose. If you want that HD look or you've never played them before and you just want a modern version, I, I think this works. So yeah, that price point is something that's going to be hard to get over, I think. Um, but I, I think we're going to see more of this. We've seen a lot of collections of games that have been priced really low. I, I, and I, I'm thinking specifically about the um, the Konami collections that came out, the Castlevania one, uh, the Contra one. They, those were really good. And you got like six to eight games for, for under twenty dollars, you know. And yes, they they weren't remakes or remasters, but still, those games still play very well today. And they had like um, save states and stuff like that to make them more playable. They did add some uh, extra things to those original games, but there isn't enough work here really to to help justify that cost. I think you really do have to like these games. It is surprising to see how much they're charging for mm-hmm. the individuals. 
Well, it's like Collection of Mana came out a couple of years ago, and I, I don't even think it was full price. And you got it wasn't no, it was uh, three I, I, games out of that. Thirty nine ninety nine, I want to say, was maybe the Canadian price or forty nine, but it, yeah, it, it was wasn't full retail for sure. Yeah, it was almost like half half retail, and and you were getting a re kind of I would call them remastered versions, like they looked. They were upscaled for the Switch, at least, you know. I mean, we never and we'd never had Trials of Mana b at, at any at any point. Oh yeah, brand you know, new in, game in, in, yeah, in the West, right? So yeah, yeah. totally new game. Um, and then you had the Trials of Mana remake, which was also not full priced, right? That, that was a yeah. <laughs> that was a full full remake, <laughs> full you know, in every sense of the word. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it is it is funny, you know, we keep kind of having these discussions. The topic keeps coming up of of the value of a remake, the value of a remaster. And now really it's the value of a collection, you know, getting multiple games that have had some treatment done to them. Like what, what is that worth? How much is that going to cost? Um, if, if I think of these games as being geared towards fans mostly, and that that's kind of what I'm thinking about is I think they want fans of this series to buy these games. Uh, I, 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 the, I think the, the public it's Atlas, right. Uh, that's published these ones, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, and develop them. I, they, they want to know if they can continue the Etrian Odyssey series without a dedicated touchscreen or without needing a dedicated touchscreen. Um, and I, and I, I, so I think they want to see how sales go with this one. And it's going to be, it's going to be a, a tougher task, a tougher ask with the inflated price. So I, I do wish that the price was a little bit more reasonable on these, if I'm, if I'm being honest. And I don't, I don't like to talk about pricing and reviews, but on a podcast, I'm happy, you know, happy to admit that I, I think these games are, uh, should be a little bit cheaper given what's gone into them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the the big question, I guess, is 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 how this game plays. Because I, mm. it, this is one of the Atlas franchises that I'm probably the least familiar with. I I have played uh, un I think it was Untold Two, I think there's two, right? Yeah, um, uh, there were two Untold games. The first one and the second one. It was the kind of their remake uh, series, I guess, that, that stopped at the second game actually. Yeah, I'm pretty. I don't know if I still have the second one or not. I definitely played it because I remember. Um, what I remember of it is it kind of f felt like playing uh, kind of a classic SMT with like the yes. grid movement. Yeah. But then there was like the mechanic of you had the, the touch screen below where you're kind of filling in the map as you go. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea how they would <laughs> make this. I remember seeing the, the trailer where they're like, oh, well, the map's on like the right hand of the screen and uh, and, you know, you got your main view or whatever. But I, I have no idea how they would how they've implemented this map drawing and you're, you're going to have to uh, let me and everyone else know how the hell does that work? Yeah, for sure. Uh, let, let's backtrack just slightly, just for, for those who have never played an Etrian Odyssey game and want to know what, what the heck are they, these games about. So uh, Etrian Odyssey is a series of dungeon crawling RPGs where you basically get into a town, you create a party of five adventurers. Uh, you can choose their job classes. Uh, I think the third game has some really interesting job classes. I'll, I'll try to talk about that a, a bit later. But yeah, you choose your party of five um, and they all have different uh, skill trees, skills that you can unlock as you level up. Um, you're going into this dungeon and you're kind of going from floor to floor, generally going going down into the labyrinth, into kind of the depths of this uh, multi-floor dungeon. Uh, every five floors or so is referred to as a stratum. Uh, and so there are probably about five or six strata, maybe 25 to 35 floors in total in the dungeon. Uh, and so the, the story, every, every kind of stratum is it has its own kind of like story mission attached to it. Generally, uh, there'll be a little bit of light storytelling, uh, not a ton. The Untold games one and two, the second one that you played, those had additional story beats added to them. And they had like a dedicated party of five that named characters, I believe, and a little bit more story added. In. And then, so that's what the remake on 3DS of the first game and then the second game in the untold versions on 3ds that it added a little bit more story uh, in these in these base versions and then the hd uh versions we have here on switch uh yeah the, the story is still pretty bare bones it's much more about just the the kind of the challenge of, of grinding through the dungeon um kind of doing the the mapping right so the mapping is a huge part of this series um as you approach each floor the the map uh, on the on the right side of the screen or on the DS it was on the bottom screen as you mentioned David uh, it, it's completely bare and so you're supposed to use a stylus uh, to draw it in or on Switch you can use the touch screen so you could use a stylus or use your finger to draw it in there's also an auto map uh, function that you can turn on or off so if you leave that on 
the walls of corridors and the walls of areas will be filled in as you go. And then you just need to fill in landmarks like doors, uh, treasure chests, um, points of interest. You can you grab little icons from the from your touchscreen uh, or using the button controls, uh, which I'll mention in a second. Um, you can point out uh, mining spots where you can mine for resources. Um, you can also indicate secret passages. Uh, and once you've activated a secret passage, it'll actually glow. Uh, it'll change color on your map. So you'll know that it's accessible from from either the left side or the right side or, or whatever. Um, so the way the so if you're not wanting to touch your screen, if you're switch or if you're playing like uh, me, in, if you're playing dog, who mode, wants right? fingerprints on that no, switch screen? Exactly. You don't. Anyone with, with glasses or, or, you know, a cell phone just hates smudges. Yeah, you definitely don't want to be touching your, your touch screens there. Um, but if you're playing docked mode as well. So the the way the button controls work are uh, you're basically using the right stick of the controller to activate a, a menu at the top right corner. The menu has all the icons you want to use, such as the, again, the aforementioned, the door, closed door, open door, the stairs going up, stairs going down, treasure chest open. Uh, the mining, different mining areas, the different, uh, you could use like an exclamation point symbol for a point of interest or something you need to come back to later. Uh, there's arrows you can use to indicate uh, secret passages that you want to use later or to show you what direction the secret passages flow in if they only flow in one direction. Um, you're co- using a combination of the right stick and then you use the ZL and ZR buttons to grab an icon and then place it on the map. And it might not it might not sound overly complicated, but when it comes to grabbing the icon and bringing it down to the actual map, which is in the bottom right corner, and then placing the icon in the right place, or if you place it wrongly, trying to pick it up and move it, all of this is very cumbersome. It doesn't work very well. It doesn't feel good. I think if you maybe practice with it a bunch, you might become more comfortable with it. But you know, across my playthrough of the third game. Uh, you know, 20 plus hours, I, I think, um, I, I don't know if it shows the time or if I can remember the time, but uh, I rolled credits nonetheless. And, and I, I just, I used the button controls, you know, a handful of times and it still never felt very good. Uh, so I, I, I just resorted to using the touch screen. And then in some of the later dungeons, I was kind of just trying to fly through them a little bit. So I didn't mark down everything in my map. Uh, my, my maps in the first half of the game were much more thorough. But yeah, I, I don't think the button controls are great here. I think they are... Um, a stopgap, kind of a half measure, maybe. Um, I, I found myself just wanting to either grab a stylus or just touch my touch screen as, as little as possible. But I, when I'm adding a few things, especially the um, the doors and, and stairwells, I did want to indicate where those were and the secret passages, obviously. But yeah, it's not great. It's not. It's not the best. Not the best. It's funny these, uh, you know, you had the, because the DS and 3DS were around for so long and you had these games that were specifically designed for it. Uh, I know like, you know, with game preservation, it's nice to have these updated versions for Switch. But just some of these games, just they don't, it just doesn't seem like it makes sense to me <laughs> to even, like I, I get, it, I guess it's, you know, maybe worth the, worth the try. Like the really hardcore people may, uh, you know, they, they, this is what they want. Maybe they'll put up with the differences. But, um, you know, I, I actually own uh, Neo, The World Ends With You. Mm. And I've been reluctant to play it because uh, after playing The World Ends With You on DS, I'm just like, I, I, I can't even fathom how they've figured out how to how to do the uh, the combat system on, on a non-dual screen. Like, not even a touch screen, just a non-dual screen. Because like they, you know, when in the world ends with you, you had a character on the top screen and a character on the bottom screen. You had to use your left hand to to control the character on the top screen, and then you're using your right hand with the stylus, and you're just draw like you're literally drawing moves. Like you have to draw circles, or you have to tap, or you're moving uh, Nico around with the stylus. And I like it just I can't even compute how they would figure that out. Like there yeah. there must be some weird 
thing where I think I read somewhere or heard something about like uh, there's a lot of automation for the top character now or something. And it's like, well, what's the point then? <laughs> like, yeah. You know, um, and and I feel like it almost does a disservice to like because if you've never played Etrian Odyssey and you're coming in, you could easily like I feel like you might be turned off by the cumbersome of, of it and not realize yeah. how good the these games are on their original platforms. I mean, we, we talk about games that use a console to the best of its ability, right? Or, or use it to its utmost capacity, right? Etrian Odyssey was one of those games for DS and then 3DS, right? It, it was the perfect, one of the perfect use cases of the dual screen consoles that Nintendo came up with. Having, you know, the action, like your, your turn-based battles, your exploration, um, your first person kind of perspective on the top screen, and then drawing the map on the bottom screen. It, it's fantastic. It's an excellent Im- implementation. Um, the, these games just had such a cozy, perfect fit on the DS and 3DS. And you know, I think I think there ended up being five or six of them all, all in. Uh, and then two more with the the, re- the untold remakes on 3DS. So you have about eight Etrian Odyssey games across DS and 3DS. And then I get trying, you, you want to try it, right? You want to try bringing them to a different platform. You want to try to fu- get them a home on Switch or you maybe just see what the player base thinks, right? I, I think, I really do think this is a test, right? It's a test of whether they should make more of these games. Should they yeah. do a new one if there isn't a lot of love for an Etrian game on a non-dual screen console? And so we'll see, you know, we'll see if people are going to buy this game. You know, we gave it, Donald and I gave one and three 7.5s. Uh, Neil gave the second game an eight. Uh, I think that might be right. I think the the second game probably is the best of the three. Um, uh, having having played all of them to some extent or in some some form, I think that's right. But yeah, it, it's can we get over the the map making uh, just being so good on the on the two screen handhelds and being kind of mediocre and and that being the map making being such a important part of the DNA of this franchise, right? Like it, it's what separates this game from other dungeon crawlers, right? I think Donald referred to uh, the game wizardry in his, in his review, an NES game or a, a, con, a computer game where, yeah, you, you, you have the, the first person dungeon crawling, like th- that was kind of an original form of RPGs. And we've seen other games do dungeon crawling before, but none have made map making like this, kind of really 1A, 1B kind of gameplay mechanic, right? It, it is such a fun, it, relaxing part of the game, right? Like we, mm-hmm. you, you think about like kind of filling in like a Sudoku grid or, or playing Minesweeper or um, a crossword, you know, filling in a map is kind of like that. Like you you want to get to 100% completion of your map. You want to mark everything, not just so you can come back to it later, but just so that when you look at your map, you're like, oh, I found everything here. Now I can move on to the next map. You know, it, it is, it's like an adult coloring book or something, you know, <laughs> yeah. so it's it, that, that's, that's version. definitely lost to some extent in this version, unless you do just grab a stylus and just, just draw on, draw on your, your switch console with a, your makeshift stylus there. Yeah. Um, it is. Yeah. It, it's tricky. It's tricky to get over the fact that something feels like it's missing here. Well, what's funny is uh, it seems like this is a generation late because it would have been perfect for Wii U. Oh yeah, that's right. Exactly. It still had a built-in stylus for some reason, and yeah. and the and the two screens, right? And exactly. the two screens. Yeah, yeah it would be yeah. perfect. Like you have your map on your gamepad, and you'd have your stylus right there. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, it, it's like how uh, Wind Waker just felt better playing because it's like, well, you had the, you had the menu system right in front of you, so you could flip through your inventory real quick. Yeah. Like, yeah. Even even Xenoblade X was great on on the Wii U, right? For for second use of the of the, of the screen, uh, and, and Wii U did have a few games that made use of the two screen functionality quite well. But the thing was, the 3DS was still going strong during the Wii U era. So you you might they so they just put Etrian Odyssey games on the 3DS instead. Right. It made a ton of sense, right? Yeah, yeah. So they they remake one and two for 3D for 3DS. I think Etrian Odyssey four, if I'm not mistaken, is is the first maybe uh mainline entry that comes and then they've got Etrian Odyssey 5 and then I think the sixth game was Etrian Odyssey Nexus which kind of borrowed parts of the previous games or brought brought dungeons from the previous games forward and kind of put them into this one massive uh labyrinth uh, so that was a pretty cool game re- re- again I-, I highly recommend this series if you can get those games on on DS or 3DS play those for sure and, and that's the way they're meant to be played 
this this switch version is it's a good game because I, I think at the heart of the experience it's still fun if you like punishing challenging rpgs where you have to grind you get to customize your party you have to think about what abilities they have and how the abilities synergize all of that is very enjoyable here like the the rpg-ness of these Etrian odyssey games right up there you know up there with 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 the best of rpgs but the other aspect is creating that map and the story uh, those are those are lacking here right it's it's almost a shame that we didn't get these story editions of the untold versions in in this collection um and i i guess it's because the third game never got an untold remake on 3ds that uh they they just wanted they were just going to go back to the original three versions on ds so it's it's yeah i i I just i have mixed feelings about this game even though i do i do like it and i enjoyed playing it Uh, i remember when they when these games were announced at uh the the direct i think it was earlier in the year i was i was over the moon i was like oh this is awesome i love this series i i can't wait to play it on switch not thinking how exactly are they going to implement the the map making which is it which is a huge part so um i think if you're if you're on the fence, if you're not sure, I, I think these games are still good, uh, good to very good, but the, 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 this is not the best way to play them. Uh, the, the visuals are not enough. Um, I do like how, and I think this is an addition to all three of the games, is that you can change the difficulty at any time. So I, I, the, it might have been that the original games, once you set the difficulty at the beginning of the game, you had to stick with that. Um, oh, okay. But this one, there are three options um basically easy medium and hard uh medium is medium is a good challenge it, it's it's still quite tough um hard i imagine is, is very very difficult i actually haven't tried playing on that mode before the easiest setting is called picnic and it's really easy <laughs> it's really easy picnic is a great name for it because it yeah. it feels like you're out for a sunday stroll and you've run into some some tigers some lions some bears and you know they, they're going down instantly like you turn on the auto battle feature and within seconds, you've won. You've won, and you you are in no danger whatsoever. So there's a gap between the the normal difficulty and the easiest setting that's maybe a little bit too far apart for my preference. Um, but the the flip side of that is a it makes the game really approachable for newcomers if you've never played a game like this before. You could get into the picnic setting, get a sense of it, um, and then maybe switch to normal once you kind of figured figured out the mechanics and stuff. Um, but the picnic thing is also great for grinding. Like if you, the, you might want to do a lot of grinding in this game because <laughs> uh, a, you need the experience points to gain, to gain new skills and new and level ups. But the way that you earn gold uh, and actually increase the stock of items to purchase is by taking back uh, the parts or items dropped by enemies and selling them at the store. So you sell X number of parts or things you find in the dungeon from mining or collecting uh, at these gathering spots. You bring those back to the store and by selling those components, you unlock new items, new weapons, armor, uh, equipment to to, equ- uh, to to put on your characters. So that that's kind of a uh, an interesting thing that's made easier by that that switching of difficulties, which is kind of nice. So um, you're not you're not constantly need to go back and heal or go back to the inn or revive uh dead party members just because you want to grind for for an hour or something like that so that that is nice i will give them that yeah well that's definitely the best thing about any of these kind of remasters or ports or whatever is uh, getting all these quality of life improvements in the in the specifically for like difficulty and stuff because there's nothing worse than (laughs) getting stuck at a certain point and then being like okay do i invest uh x amount of time to grind to the point where i can beat you know said uh challenge or do mm-hmm. i just like call it call it a day and move on in the next game yeah um one of the i meant to say one of the uh, other major mechanics of of Etrian odyssey which sets it apart from some other games is you have in the dungeons you have these kind of super bosses um or super mini bosses i guess that are very very difficult when you first see them they're called foes um, when you see an FOE, generally you want to avoid it and until you've maybe gone past it and gone to the next floor and leveled up a little bit more, improved your equipment and stuff like that. But when you come back to, uh, or you're revisiting a floor, you're making your way back through the dungeon again. Um, you may want to, you may want to battle one of these FOEs and they're, they're generally really tough, just really tough boss fights. And you're going to have to use strategies like you're going to have to bind their, bind their head or bind their arms so they can't use particular moves or you want to use status effects or stat buffs. Like this isn't a game where you can just fight 
heal and use offensive magic and win, you really have to make use of um, buffs and debuffs to to get through uh, these FOE battles in particular. And then you know the boss fights at the end of each stratum are uh, incredibly tough. Like you you really have to be prepared for those. Uh, you know again through through grinding through having the best equipment or for forging your equipment to make it stronger or to add particular uh, buffs to the equipment too. Um, there's a, there's a lot of the, again, a lot of those kind of little RPG things uh, or RPG mainstays, classic RPG gameplay that's in here. That's very good. You know, the progressing with your characters through skill trees, fighting tough bosses, maybe failing and needed to come back and try a new strategy. All of that is very fun here. I, I don't want to under undersell that. I really like that element of the games, but um I did. I did want to return to the job classes of Etrian Odyssey three because I think they're kind of fun in particular. One and two, the job classes are a little bit more basic. You know, your fighter, your healer, your black mage, like that kind of stuff. But in Etrian Odyssey three, you have you have some other ones you can play around with. Um, so one one that I really like uh, is I think it's called the Sovereign, and the Sovereign is um, one that he's gonna or this character is gonna buff your uh, attack or defense. Or if they stay alive or stay at full health, they can actually restore your whole party's health every turn. So they've got this really cool ability you can unlock. I don't remember the name of it, but uh, basically it means uh, if you add points to this skill uh, and your character, every round of combat, they still have 100% HP, your whole party will get HP back. So you ha- you're kind of incentivized to keep them in the back, maybe have their evasion stat a little bit higher, make sure they're not getting hit as often as you can. Uh, and then they'll be they'll heal the party in turn. They later later kind of uh, versions of that ability. Uh, you can gain HP when you win a battle. You can gain HP just by taking steps in the dungeon. So I found this sovereign class very very helpful. Um, you have a monk who uh, is not only a healer, uh, maybe even a primary healer, but also can fight with uh, clubs or can fight barehanded if you level up the particular stat for fighting barehanded. So you've got that one. Uh, obviously you have like a the defensive type classes where they're they're trying to provoke the enemy so the enemy directs all their attacks there uh you do have black mages as well but you have uh, a class uh like the farmer or or i think one of the games might call them something different but the farmer is basically someone they're not meant to fight they they will be in your party during combat but they're not a fighter uh or a healer or anything like that they're strictly meant to make it so that as you traverse the dungeon you gain more you can gain more experience you can collect more items you can get more rare items maybe you can avoid enemy encounters through some of their abilities but it's really cool to have a class that is basically terrible when you bring them into a fight but very helpful when you're just exploring the dungeon i i love that they you kind of think about that aspect of the game that the outside of combat phase is being really really important and it is here uh, the exploration and you know, just just collecting and selling materials and, and getting the best equipment, finding the rare materials, like all of that stuff's very, very important here. So I suppose you could call that part of the grind. I think it's fun. I, I like seeing how the, the fruits of your labor, you know, the, that you do get stronger, you do get more capable, and then you can take on uh, more and more of those FOE enemies that you find. Um, a farmer having a farmer class. And you can just put them in your stable that you don't have to bring them with you at all times. You can say, okay, I'm going to go fight the boss. Now I'll take out my fighters, my, my five, uh, my, my stronger warriors. And then I'll leave my farmer uh, back at the guild or back at the um, back in town. And then when you go and you're just doing exploring, you're not doing a lot of heavy combat. You bring the farmer back out uh, and you can, you can kind of grind for materials that way. So some really cool job classes in this game. I think that's another thing that makes it a, a more standout RPG. It, it's not just your typical um, JRPG archety- uh, archetypes, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I'd say my biggest takeaway from this episode has been that uh, Nintendo needs to develop uh, a second screen accessory that uh, snaps onto the Switch and connects via the USB-C port on the bottom because it's like perfectly placed where you like, kind of just shove it into the port and it'll hang right there. You get your second screen, and then uh, developers uh, can have an easier time porting old DS and 3DS games because you'll you have know, two screens. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of the Circle Pad Pro for 3DS. Oh, yeah. That, that, <laughs> that Frankenstein uh, attachment, basically, yeah. that added the extra stick or whatever uh, so you could play a game like Kid Icarus Uprising. Right? You remember that one? I never, I never yeah. owned one, but I remember seeing them and thinking, like, 
what is this? Like, it's just a ridiculous <laughs> peripheral. You know, it reminds me of uh, the, those old Game Boy peripherals that were just, you know. Yeah, the magnifying per- glass with the built-in light. The light, yeah, the yeah. battery pack, all those things that just make it super, super bulky and add like 10 times the weight to it or something like yeah. that. Yeah, it'll probably, you, you put the dual screen on the Switch and it'll probably bring the battery down to last about 30 minutes. That's right, exactly. <laughs> and well, maybe Switch 2 will be, two. it'll be Switch 2 because it'll, have, it'll go back to being two screens or something like that. Um, oh, man. I'd love to see uh, the internet uh, if if uh, Switch Two ends up having two screens. When Switch Two gets announced, inevitably, uh, I, yeah, it'll be great to see the uh, all the mockups and stuff because the mockups for the original Switch were great. Like I still you still chuckle when I see some of the those ones. <laughs> that that oval, <laughs> the oval was the best. The with, oval yeah, one with the, the, bu- the buttons, the buttons like, in inside the screen. the screen. Oh god, just just <laughs> classic, man. Like. How could anyone think that Nintendo is going to put out something like this? I get the Wii U was a flop and they did Virtual yeah. Boy, but oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I just want to leave people with the, um, uh, the idea that, you know, the, these are still very, very good games. Uh, and, you know, even if their translation to Switch is not perfect, I think you can find a way to enjoy them. Whether that's yeah, using a stylus, using your finger on a touch screen, a touch screen, God forbid, you know, to bring, bring the lens cleaner. Uh, or, or maybe again, maybe the button controls just click for you. I think that's going to happen for some of the people that pick up this game. They'll just they they will gel with this new control scheme, uh, and we'll see if that that's good enough and the reception's good enough for these games to to warrant more Retro Odyssey games. I, I don't want the series to end here by any means. I think I, I do hope they will find maybe some more elegant solutions. Uh, and may, again, maybe that is on the next Switch console that has some ability to do something. I have no idea. But I, I, I hope that the series will continue and they'll find a way to uh, maybe make the map making more of an automated or something like that. Or, um, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 again, I'm not a game developer, uh, but I am curious to see uh, what, 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 uh, what comes out of this, uh, this, this collection and then uh, what, what the future holds for uh, more Etrian Odyssey games. Um, it's definitely my favorite type of dungeon crawler. And I think somewhere either this year or next, we need to play another similar dungeon crawler with Persona Q2 on 3DS. David, did you end up picking that up before the eShop closed? I feel like I I, I think I bought it and then just never downloaded it. Yeah, but yeah. I might have been the exact be same. because it, it was like under 10 bucks at some point, I think. So it's yeah. pretty hard to pass up at that, <laughs> at that point. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I'm... I, uh, it's funny because then I'm thinking like, was it Q1 or Q2? I can't even remember which one. Yeah, but I'm I, pretty I sure I, I got grabbing, one. Of them. I grabbed both, and we we can just play whatever one, whatever you have, or or, or play uh, play the opposite one. Doesn't even matter. But yeah, yeah I, I always have an itch to play more of these games. Like when I play an Etrian Odyssey game, I'm like, oh, I want to play another one like this. Maybe not necessarily an Etrian Odyssey game, but the Persona Q series I like to go back to for sure. Um, I. I reviewed the third game here of this collection uh, and I, I started up uh, the first and second just to get a little bit of footage or, or capture some of the footage for for music for the reviews. And I'm like, oh, I kind of had already rolled credits on the third game and I, and I was really tempted to just start a new game of, of the first or second one. Uh, uh, but, you know, it, Tears of the Kingdom is calling my name, so I can't. I can't. I can't do another Switch game until Diablo finished, Four but... is only days away from the, oh my gosh, from, as of yeah. the recording too. So. Isn't that ridiculous? Yeah, we're, yeah. we're all going to be uh, knee deep in hell, <laughs> Casey <laughs> and I in particular. But yeah, lots of good games coming out uh, in June. Uh, FF6, uh, FF6, FF6, FF16, uh, Diablo Four, uh, and then. Yeah, you know, we're we're also really close to whatever uh, summer game fest uh, or whatever the the you know the game makers are obviously going to have. Uh, oh, the E three uh, equivalent. E three, whatever E three is yeah. this month or next month, that, that that that's weeks away at this point. So I think uh, we're going to start getting announcements for the second half of the year. So I'm I'm really excited to see uh, what else is coming down the pipe here. Yeah, I'm excited to see it. I don't think my wallet is. No, oh gosh, no. Yeah, so you, you've you've still got renovations to handle. At the very least, my my renovations are in the rearview mirror, and I can start to <laughs> maybe <laughs> start saving up some money for games again. But yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think that'll do us for uh, this episode as well. Uh, so just a, a little look at uh, the Etrian Odyssey Origins collection uh, coming to Switch. It comes to Switch on June first. So if you're listening to this, it's already out. Uh, you can pick up uh, the whole set of games for a little bit of a discount. I think it's almost like uh, getting one of the games for free. Uh, but yeah, it, it is still uh, a steeper cost for these games. The collection and the individual titles uh, a little bit, a little bit more expensive than we'd like to see. So uh, something to consider for sure. 
Um, I don't know if there'll be a demo coming out for these games at some point. I hope so. Uh, but if not, you know, definitely check out uh, our reviews on NWR. Uh, we've got YouTube versions as well uh, for Donald's version of uh, Donald's review of Etrianazi 1, Neil's version, uh, Neil's review of 2, and then mine of 3. Those will all be available for your reading or viewing pleasure. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we are on Spotify. Check us out there uh, or on your podcast app of choice. Leave us a review. Leave us uh, five stars. That's awesome. Helps with visibility. Uh, of course, questions or suggestions, go to David, david at thethirstymage.com. We'd love to hear from you as we kind of plan out the uh, second half of the year. I, I can't believe we're already, you know, basically we're June here, right? We're, we're already into June. So uh, we're at the last month of the first half of the year. And We'll see. Uh, we'll see what the future holds for the Thirsty Mage and for, uh, for I guess, the gaming public in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, yeah, everyone have a great, great night, great week, and uh, bye for now. Bye. bye.